All 80s kids know how lucky they were to grow up in that decade, and a big part of that were the cartoons that were made just for us. Rainbow-colored girls, robots that turned into cars, holographic pop stars, muscled warriors who weirdly never used their swords to battle the bad guys. The 1980s were packed with iconic cartoons, and now, 40 or so years later, the great pop culture debate wants to determine the best 80s cartoon of all time. Like a Transformer, I'm more than eats the eye, but like a Gobot, not really that much more. I'm your host, Eric Resniak. Please help me welcome my panel. He came here to do two things, chew bubblegum and smurf some ass. It's Brendan Hay. And I'm all out of bubblegum, Eric. So now I've got to figure out how to smurf some ass? Mm, I I recommend starting with poppers. Mm -hmm. I assure you, Vanity Smurf (laughs) approves. (laughs) Just like Rainbow Bright, his sidekicks are named Twink and Starlight. It's Derek Makita. Yeah, sidekicks. (laughs) We'll go with that. Hey, didn't they compete on this recent season of Drag Race? Oh, filler queens, filler queens. (laughs) Finally, she's my openly contemptuous villain sidekick, but we all love her anyway. It's Kate Reculia. Wow. That's all I have. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Imagine that I'm a cat. I want to be Azriel. There we go. It's the tastiest vitamin and the best sidekick. Okay, type very fair. I get that. Yeah. I love it. Great. So before we get to the debate, how does this work? We made a poll of dozens of notable cartoons that aired original episodes on American television between 1980 and 1989. If they started in the 70s but still aired in the 80s, they were fair game. If they started in the late 80s and went into the 90s, we let them in. We tallied the votes, ranked the picks by popularity, and added them to a bracket. Now we argue about it and insult each other all for your amusement. Want to play along at home? You can. Head to greatpopculturedebate.com and go to the polls and brackets section. There you'll find the down downloadable listener brackets for this and every episode of our little show do your picks match up with ours do you think we should see if uncle scrooge can buy us a clue let us know by dropping a comment on this episode at our website or by yelling at us on twitter instagram or mastodon if you're curious about how we went from the top 32 down to the sweet 16 become a patreon supporter of our podcast our patreon supporters at the five dollar level or higher get exclusive access to the warm-up slash part ones for each episode in which we work our way through all of round one it's like a whole bonus episode for each topic and it includes arguments you will not hear anywhere else and it's just one of our great patreon perks so please subscribe and with that out of the way it's showtime synergy as we move on to these debates it's a unanimous victory for ultimate number one seed ducktales which called pest control on five seed alvin and the chipmunks i guess huey dewey and louie are superior to alvin simon and theodore but it needs to be said justice for the chipettes <laughs> Next, the panel is in a Disney dilemma as it is split between two seed The Adventures of the Gummy Bears and three seed Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Brendan solved the mystery as to why Chip and Dale should advance. Kate, drink up some of that gummy berry juice and empower your arguments for the gummy bears. I'm going to have Brendan go first. Um, this is actually a really close call. I could. This is not one where. Um... I really think one is that much better than the other. I actually really love both. I could be swayed pretty easily either way. Um, to me, it comes down to character. The gummy bears um, are really fun. I mainly though remember the antics of the gummy berry juice, less the specific personalities. Chip and Dale, as well as the rest of their group, actually had solid characters. And uh, just something to repeat myself slightly from a Patreon episode, I think that's even why... Um, the film that was made last year on Disney Plus, the Chippendale Rescue Rangers kind of revisiting, works as well as it does is these characters had such strong, distinct personalities, were able to play off each other in such fun ways in the original cartoon that even revisiting it 30 years later, it still plays as funny because you can actually still remember, like, yeah, that's, that is Monterey Jack. That was his thing. That's how he spoke. That's how he would act, how he would respond to this. Chip and Dale, which... In a lot of Disney shows, if you have two characters who have very similar designs, and honestly, a lot of Disney leads in some of these cartoons, not always the most interesting characters, but Chip and Dale actually had really good bickering dynamics and had different points of views on things. And yeah, again, just the characters for them give, for me, give them the edge over gummy bears. All right, Kate, what about you? Gummy bears. So gummy bears, uh, as uh, Derek mentioned in the uh, the warm up Patreon for Patreon members, it's great. Uh, it was um, 
Disney in the 1980s sort of like invested a ton of money in basically making cartoons that were high quality animation, bet making that bet that they could sort of like get eyeballs that way. And guess what? They were right. So Gummy Bears and the Wuzzles, which I also talked about in the warm up, um, were sort of their first two uh, really high quality animated shows. They look like Disney animation that was on a Saturday morning. And it was mind blowing to get that quality. This show just looked better like the Wuzzles, than anything else really that was on television in terms of craftsmanship. Um, yes, Benjamin, I totally agree. The characters on Rescue Rangers were more distinct. They were better characters. It was a sort of a better concept. Um, the concept of the Gummy Bears, which also had an iconic theme song, which like you're singing it, if you know what it is, you're singing it in your head right now. Um, <laughs> the concept, which hilariously in its Wikipedia art- article says is, quote, loosely inspired by the Gummy Bear candies. Uh, (laughs) takes place in a fantasy world of medieval lands and magic and focuses on the lives of seven mystical beings known as gummy bears yeah that's in name alone and i mean yeah anyway whatever (laughs) um so uh it just its concept is a little weird which is why i think it actually is the more 80s because it is actually based on a product that they're trying to sell you and they just ended up making a really beautiful looking show but you also you don't get rescue rangers without gummy bears you don't get ducktales without gummy bears you don't even get animaniacs different studio but it was the first show that was like oh crap there's a real audience for high quality well-written well-made children's animation so thanks gummy bears that's a really good point yeah uh derek what have you got i hear that this is a very difficult match matchup for me because um i love both Um, They're both sort of near and dear to me in that kind of like sweet spot in the 80s. I hear what Kate is saying about the gummy bears really only existing in the 80s, whereas Chip and Dale were sort of legacy Disney characters that were sort of brought into function for this show. Um, I still think Chip and Dale feels more fresh somehow, um, because I don't think without, without Chip and Dale, I don't think... There, you have the through line to DuckTales to um, Tailspin eventually in the 90s. So, like, I feel like it's more important somehow. So I'm going to stick with Chip and Dale. So this is – I'll tell you what's super interesting to me is that Gummy Bears is a two seed and Chip and Dale is a three seed. And that shocked me mm. because if you had told me on the street that people f- voted more for Gummy Bears than Chip and Dale, I would be shocked. But I saw it myself. No. Um, I think – there's a great argument being made that you, like, you wouldn't have any of those Disney shows. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it goes beyond Tailspin. It goes to Darkwing Duck. They had a, a, just an unending s- s- Gargoyles. You don't get gargoyles yeah. without yeah. gummy bears. Yeah. No, you're right. Right. Yeah. With, without them. But at the same time, I think it's worth noting that Disney themselves have abandoned this property. They have not touched it, so far as I know of, in decades. Does Brandon will, know something? I was going to say, I... Can I'm not sure how much I can actually say, but um, they've tried. Uh, it only internally uh, has never gotten particularly far at all. But uh, they, it is on their radar. They are aware they haven't done anything with it, and it does get shots every now and then. I just like tell me the gay community would not go crazy <laughs> for a gummy bear show. Like Ruffy, I'm mm. thinking. <laughs> I'm just like. They all like get super powered by drinking. They're bouncing on each other. Like this is <laughs> itself. I'm sorry. Like I don't know if they'd want to, you know, actually like endorse the merch, but I can see it in my mind. Um, but yeah, it's it, it is interesting to me. I guess uh, I think I voted for gummy bears here. Um, so right now I have Kate for gummy. I have Brendan for Chippendale, and I have uh, Derek for Chippendale. Yes. I will um, say I might actually throw my vote to Gummy based on the the argument of we would have none of the others without is because again I like both I, I genuinely like both I'm actually going to flip to Gummy. Okay, and even if you hadn't, it wouldn't have mattered because well, Gummy Bears is a two seed again in a tie. It would have advanced over Chip and Dale. So 
we will be advancing the gummy bears kind of frankly shockingly into Mm -hmm. round three next the majority of the panel wants to feel the turtle power of those heroes in a half shell one seed teenage mutant ninja turtles but kate is still so emotional over four seed the care bears derek explain why the turtles were so (laughs) radical dude (laughs) kate express your feelings about the care bears and i'm gonna have derek go first yeah um audience buckle up because some of these matchups are just like wackadoo (laughs) (laughs) they have no business going up against each other but uh, honestly maybe that's almost better like you wouldn't want to put like two dude shows together because then it's like what's the point of arguing those two things um but admittedly this one's a bit of a stretch for me it's not in my personal top tier mostly because it's more of a dude show and i was i was a delicate flower child um so but it is a pop culture juggernaut. Um, like many in these brackets, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles began life as a rather dark comic book series mm-hmm. and then yep. mm-hmm. led to a line of action figures, which led to this iconic animated show, films, and then reboots. Um, the crime-fighting adventures of four mutant anthropomorphic Ninja Turtle superheroes named after Renaissance artists <laughs> with an insatiable appetite for pizza and a rat sensei named Splinter set in 1980s New York City. This has 80s written all over. Over it. <laughs> to say that the 1990 film is an icon is iconic is an understatement. Mm-hmm. Um, it was mm-hmm. in fact the highest grossing independent film up until that point, believe it or not. Um, but it would never have been possible without this late 80s animated show. All, all the associated all the associated merch, in fact, added up to 1.1 billion dollars in toys sold between 1988 and 1992. That's only four Christmas seasons, um, (laughs) making them the third best-selling toy figures at the time. I have distinct memories of a good one or two year period where Ninja Turtles were the go-to Halloween costume for boys. Mm -hmm. And then it happened again um, when the first film came out. Um, It has been rebooted so many times into TV, into TV, films, video games, you name it. And it more than earns its place in these brackets. Yeah, I mean, that one, even like when one animated series ends, I feel like a new Turtles animated series begins. It just yep. never stops. Mm-hmm. Um, Kate, talk to us about the Care Bears. Look, I can't, I can't step to that. I can't, right? Um, but at the same time, I did not watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I watched the Care Bears a lot, especially the movies, which, as we talked about in the uh, warm-up, were very strangely dark and beautifully animated by Nelvana, uh, and were themselves the highest-grossing animated films outside of Disney films at the time that the first one was released. They're based on an American greetings card design. It is a property that exists and was sold to children to sell things, and what is more 80s than that, I ask you. Also, they just, like, they stare and, like, rainbows come out of their bellies. Like, that... (laughs) I can't hate it. I can't hate it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very close to my current aesthetic. I stare at people (laughs) with disapproval and I shoot rainbows. Well, not out of my bellies, but... Eric! (laughs) Um, Brendan, where are you on this? Um, I I am squarely in the turtle camp. Um, Yeah. So yeah, I'll there's... save my arguments for further down the line, but uh, turtles. What were you going to say, Kate? I, yeah, I can't. It's fine. The care, the care bears would be like these aggressive teenage turtles. <laughs> but actually, they... I would put the money on in the gang fight. I'm putting money on the Care Bears. Oh, the yeah. Care Bear, <laughs> they the would Care just wipe them out. Yeah. Michelangelo can spin the nunchucks and offer pizza all he wants. He's not going to ma- matter at all to the fucking Care Bear stare just grinding him down. Yep. Yep. And that, like I said in the beginning, the Care Bears do not have to get close to you to just, like, vaporize mm-hmm. you. Like, they yep. just they just need to point their belly at you. And <laughs> who amongst us? Before we move on from the Care Bears, like, the Care Bear stare, do we think this is, like, essentially, like, Ghost Rider's penance stare where yes. it's forcing you to look? And all the terrible decisions you've made in your 100%. life. Hundred <laughs> percent. So they're like confronting you with your inner darkness, or and be like, maybe it's like the empathetic yeah. version of the mm. penance there, but still. Yep yeah. it's it's definitely yeah. emotional warfare. That's what the bears yeah. are doing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Passive Mother? aggressive emotional warfare. That is a care bear. Mm-hmm. Mother? Yeah. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, we will be moving the Teenage Mutant and Ninja Turtles on. Next, the panel is evenly split between three seed, the real Ghostbusters, and two seed, the Smurfs. Derek, Smurf, you're Smurf and Smurf, and Smurf for votes for Smurfs. Brendan, explain why Ghostbusters are still the ones we should call, even in animated form. I will have Brendan go first. 
Um, part of this is going to, and it's funny because I think I went the opposite way on some of my earlier ones, especially on the Patreon episode. But um, to me, there is a timeless quality to Smurfs. There's a reason like they've existed even in like comic strip form for as long as they have. Real Ghostbusters is going back to the pure 80s of it all, down to the there was a, such a specifically 80s thing of how do we take a film that was mostly geared towards adults but use it to sell things to kids? Yep. And to me, mm-hmm. the Real Ghostbusters is the best version of all of those. And there were so many of those across the 80s kids' TV landscape. Um, and I think so, <clears throat> A, that's what makes it for me so 80s. And then B, I actually think it was one of the better written uh, 80s cartoons because it was the one that actually had like – the characters grew over time. Like Janine became a Ghostbuster. Like Slimer got more and more helpful. And also Slimer gets my vote for A, the best of all of the – that kind of weird subgroup of like uh, wacky sidekick type of characters in all of these cartoons. Definitely the least annoying, most kind of genuinely funny. And then B, he inspired Ecto Cooler, which was one of the best kid drinks of the 1980s <laughs> and also super Absolutely. 80s. And yeah. then also my last thing for this – it introduced 80s kids to Cthulhu. Even, I believe, before in Humanoids, <laughs> there's a fucking Cthulhu episode of Ghostbusters that freaked me out as a kid. And then years later, as a teenager, realizing that this was based in, like, horror literature, I'm like, wow. So, yeah, Ghostbusters. Yeah, I mean, Cthulhu is for the children. And, and I think Cthulhu that's what we... <laughs> he, he is, yeah. Um, all right, so Derek, talk to me about the Smurfs. Yes. Did you know that the Smurfs originated in Belgium? I did. It's true. The They're Smurf little Euro started... trash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little Euro trash. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, the Smurfs franchise started as a Belgian comic series about a fictional colony of small blue humanoid creatures who live in mushroom-shaped houses in the forest. Uh, it became so popular that these lovable blue people expanded into advertising, films, TV series. Ice capades, mm-hmm. uh, oh. video games, theme parks, and toys. So we could say iconic, but the more apt word for the moment would be prolific. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, the Smurfs jumped onto our television sets courtesy of Hanna Barbera Productions in 1981 and ran continuously for Ready for This nine seasons. Yeah. So it had real staying power in the 80s, making it not only one of the longest running 80s cartoon shows, but also one entirely contained within that decade, mm-hmm. which. Um, some of the other longer running shows that we're going to talk about didn't necessarily all, you know, mm-hmm. stay contained within the 80s. Um, in addition to iconic characters like Papa Smurf and Smurfette and Brainy Smurf and Gargamel, um, the show also used tons of classical music compositions in the background. Mm-hmm. So we were getting a healthy dose of culture with our pop culture, and we never knew it. Um, admittedly, this is not one I watched regularly, but I absolutely had one or two stuffy Smurfs when I was a kid. In fact, mm-hmm. were you really a kid in the 80s if you didn't have a Smurf stuffy? I say no. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah it's hard to argue with that kate where are you on this one uh now did i eat smurfs uh children's chewable vitamins for the majority of the <laughs> 80s i did i did so uh you know not flintstones i was not a flintstones kid wow million strong. the flintstones once tasted gross by the way they were disgusting yeah. it was chalk they were just yeah. chalk. Yeah. the smurf cool. ones the little Azrael, that little orange cat like was delicious <laughs> anyway so but and and yes derek you make a great argument for the sort of like uh primacy of the smurfs as like a cultural juggernaut but i gotta give it up part of my rubric was what was my relationship to it i effing loved the ghostbusters the real ghostbusters cartoon it's really well written uh egon's a blonde sure like yeah. <laughs> yes sure <laughs> fine but also janine is a real character right like i feel yeah. like there are things about that show that let me into it not that I, I was never i loved ghostbusters i always felt like it was a movie for me we can talk about that actually i believe we do talk about the terrible we did talk stuff. about that yeah. in yeah. the 80s yeah. children's yeah. Yeah. that one so uh but yeah i just janine is great great in this series She's awesome. and and it's just it's a really it's great it's dark as hell and it looks great the yeah. animation is fantastic it's gorgeous yeah. yeah um i have no bad things to say about ghostbusters i will also add that it had a great bunch of toys that came out of it mm-hmm. which whether that's fair or not is part of my rubric for this because to me 80s cartoons and 80s toys are almost like mm-hmm. completely inextricably linked um yes. but like uh, for all of the reasons that Derek said, I have to move the Smurfs forward. They were the eight, like literally from the beginning of the eighties to the end, they were not just there. They were 
a juggernaut. And we talked a little bit about this in the the uh, Patreon episode, which if you don't subscribe, I'm sure you're absolutely sick of us talking about it. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> One of the things about 80s cartoons is they were highly gendered for the most part, right? They were either yeah. – there were girl cartoons mm-hmm. and there were boy cartoons, and the Smurfs was not. The Smurfs was for everybody. Mm-hmm. We watched the Smurfs, and you mentioned the video games. Like, let me tell you something. The Smurfs Coleco video game was brutal. It was absolutely <laughs> – like, it, it, I re- distinctly remember, like, this. You, there was, like, a four-pixel step, and if you didn't jump over that step, you died. Like, it was very hard. <laughs> but these are the type of foundational memories that I have. Have, and the Smurfs were everywhere in our childhood. I, I don't know why, but they were. So mm-hmm. that means we are tied. And in a tie, the top seed goes forward. And the top seed is the Smurfs here. So I get it. the Smurfs yep. will continue to well, round three. I, I, mean, I want to say one last thing on, on the Ghostbusters. Um, I will say, I having listened to the best um, 80s children's film episode, mm-hmm. um, Brendan touched on it earlier. I, I think that, you know, the Ghostbusters, the movie being really geared toward um, adults and calling it a kid's film is sort of a stretch in a way. The The cartoon was so geared towards children yes. and yeah. like all of the fondness that I think a lot of us have for the Ghostbusters. I, I wonder sometimes whether it's more for the film than the, the sort of like residual memories that we have of watching the Ghostbusters animated mm-hmm. shoot series. Yeah. You know? no, that's a really good point. I can see that. Yeah. And and my hottest of hot takes is that the the sort of like spirit and ethos of the twenty sixteen Ghostbusters is much more like the cartoon than like the yes. original movie. Oh agreed. It, that's it's interesting much point. brighter and kind of sunnier and sillier and yeah. Yeah. And and less realistic in a way that the first one is like a grungy eighties movie that has great yeah. creature effects, right? Yeah. True. Yeah. 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 True. I like that. Well, we will be moving Smurfs forward next to unanimous decisions as one seed She-Ra, Princess of Power, Spade and Neutered, five seed Heathcliff and the Cadillac Cats, and two seed Gem and the Holograms had the glamour and glitter, fashion and fame to outlive three seed Thundercats. Next up, She-Ra's brother He-Man and his Masters of the Universe, a one seed, are currently embattled by the evil forces of, checks notes, Four seed Garfield and friends. Kate, <laughs> Kate explain why He Man and the Masters of Universe have the power to oh. advance to the Elite Eight. Brendan, explain why you OD'd on Odie, Garfield, and the rest. And I will have Kate go first. I think this is an error because I think I voted for Garfield. Damn it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Brendan, you go first. I'm sorry. Uh, wait, so I'm still going for Garfield, right? Because I also voted for Garfield. Yeah, go ahead and go for Garfield. Okay, just making sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, again, so I think it is. It's funny. The one that, if we're go breaking it down, I try to do a lot of like, what is my favorite version of a type of thing in this? So it was like going back to real Ghostbusters. That's my favorite of like all of these like adaptations of movies for kids. My favorite actually in the what I would group P Man towards of like the very action heavy. Uh, action fantasy type of cartoon. Thundercats is actually my favorite example of that. I like Gem even better because I think Gem is, uh, we'll get to my favorite 80s thing possible. But Thundercats to me was the best of that form. Uh, he Man's great. Rewatching He Man is not great. I love the toys as a kid. I couldn't get enough of them, but the cartoon's a rough watch these days. Garfield, again, rewatching it, it's still funny. And like, I still remember the running gags, like the sending Nermal in a box will never <laughs> not be funny to me. Uh, Garfield just kicking Odie always, knocking him off tables, constantly funny to me. Um, John as just sad sack of the universe uh, foil for his cat is a dynamic I will never not enjoy. So it still remains funny all these years later. And I just want to repeat the thing I also would say is, um, as I said in the Patreon, 80s comedy was so defined by how is a charming asshole going to be amusing? And here's the kids' distillation of that. So I think I understand what happened because I believe <laughs> Derek had – he I had Rainbow Bright here, but Rainbow Bright got knocked out in round one. Am I correct? Uh, yes, 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 yes. So before I do my spiel on He-Man, I have to ask Derek, are you going to vote for Garfield or He-Man here? I am firmly in the Garfield camp. God damn it. Okay, so – I'm so sorry, Eric. I'm so sorry. You're, 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 on, your own, you're on your own right now with, with He-Man, so go do it. You're okay. I, I actually do have an argument prepared for this, but I was planning to do it for the next round. Um, so um, this is 
Yeah. Now this is it. I'm putting it all on the line for He Man and his pecs. Um, so I am not going to argue that He Man is the better show here. During the pandemic, my partner and I went back and rewatched the entirety of He Man. Literally, we did. We watched the whole thing. And it was terrible. There were, ter- <laughs> there were truly awful episodes. And not even in like a, we need to sell these new toys kind of terrible. But like, they did a shockingly poor job of using the characters they made toys of. And instead, there were just huge swaths of episodes that featured like rando bad wizards for whom there were no action figures. And like, it happened over and over again. And you're like, who's behind this? Like, why would you use these characters? when like, Merman, like, never gets screen time. But... <laughs> the episodes were boring or bizarre or the characters behaved very, very stupidly. And I'm looking directly at Orko when I say that. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you cannot deny He-Man's power, the power of Grayskull, mm. one might say, in the 80s zeitgeist. It was everywhere. Those action figures made $400 million in 1986 alone. Mm-hmm. In 2020 dollars, that is nearly $700 million in one year. Please tell me about how much money your your uh, Garfield action figures I made. Mean, for Garfield don't... action figures, no. Every car with a Garfield on the window yep. in the 1980s, it, it'd probably give a decent run. Well, that's fine, but we also had He-Man sheets, He-Man underoos, He-Man lunchboxes, I honestly, He-Man dinner. There were Garfields, all of these things too. Yeah, all we've of got the we've above. got two Titans swinging at each yeah, other. We do. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we do. We do. Um, but I, did I also ever, think... I mean, sorry. Did He-Man ever make you want to eat lasagna? Every day, constantly, <laughs> off, of it, off of his abs. Um, Garfield I, is all for bad body positivity. He is. That is fair. But if we're also talking, like, I'm not going to say that Garfield is not popular now. He is. Like, mm-hmm. and he had very successful movies in the 2010s, he I think, had whatever. Successful-ish movies, yes. <laughs> But, like, He-Man is still very much a a property that gets attention, right? Like, that reboot on Netflix, while highly divisive, Mm -hmm. definitely got eyeballs and attention. it did well. There are He-Man t-shirts and products everywhere to this day. Skeletor is a meme icon. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. And, like, I, I don't, like, in terms of, to me, like... I would argue that the big dick energy and the raw commercialism of He-Man captures the defining characteristics of the 80s. That's true. Better than Garfield. That's Are you my saying argument. Garfield doesn't have big dick energy? <laughs> I am absolutely. Garfield has like, I need blood thinners energy. That's what Garfield has. I was, he has big agree. chud energy. <laughs> I will agree with you on the 80s of it because I do think in a weird way, this is the this is the 80s cartoon battle of 80s cinema of like charming asshole comedies versus way too top heavy muscle bound action Mm -hmm. heroes it's stallone versus chevy chase basically or like something of that nature and it's just kind of a little bit of where you fall or what you what you want to push forward and if only we could make like the Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito and oh, twins it, both. where we have Garfield <laughs> as Battle Cat. Like that is the show I mean, that we need to see. You just, I think you just pitched what Netflix's next reboot uh, is. <laughs> we did it. Yeah. Yes, All right. Success. So, um, are you still staying with Garfield, Brendan? I am. Also, of course, I'll throw in the final argument for Garfield. The Garfield uh, – uh, this is my personal thing in, uh, in my home. Uh, my wife, Jen, uh, panelist Jennifer Chen, uh, cries every single year still at the Garfield Christmas special, which features the only moment where Garfield is openly kind to Odie. <laughs> Um, so for that personal reason, although that said, I had a ton of Masters of Universe toys. I loved He-Man as a, in the 80s. I'm still sticking Garfield. All right, Brendan. Excuse me, Derek. Yeah, I'm Eric. I hear everything you're saying. I think that as far as like toys and merch go, He Man is like an, is a juggernaut and and was and probably fuels more of the nostalgia that people have for He Man from the '80s than the actual show itself. Sure. But if I'm looking forward and saying, okay, if Garfield goes out here now. And then we have, like, in some mythical head matchup between, like, She-Ra and He-Man. Um, to me, She-Ra is a better show than He-Man. So, oh, sure. Um, yeah. I'm going to give it to Garfield here. So, 
All right, Kate. I I do have to give it to Garfield. I mean, again, your argument was impassioned, and I I I'm so grateful that I got to see you and hear you make it. Um, but yeah, it, like I feel like He Man is almost like just an '80s icon. Like he's up there with Hulk Hogan, you know. And Garfield yeah, is true. too. But I also think this is the cartoon one, right? And it, in some mm-hmm. ways, it has to come down to the like what was the actual like when I sat down on Saturday morning, I made an appointment to watch Garfield. So Garfield. Yep. Yep. Prince Adam shaved his legs for this. <laughs> All right. So I'm sorry, He Man, and especially Skeletor, I failed you. But uh, we're moving uh, Garfield and friends on. Finally, in round two, three seed the Transformers are running out of Energon as two seed Muppet Babies are about to make their dreams come true by advancing to round three. Kate, bring us into your rich fantasy world where babies roam free while I turn this massive robot dude into a regular sized gun and try to blow (laughs) holes in your arm uh kate you go first so i'm gonna just tip my hand muppet babies is the greatest 80s cartoon of all time like it's not only did it look great you know the animation of the characters and the character design is really cute and really clever it's brilliantly written uh they would interact with films and stock footage which actually was a decision based on budget and turned out to Mm -hmm. be an incredible creative boon for the way that the the kids the muppet babies got to interact with culture um and it is it is actually a children's cartoon that is very fun and is legitimately about imagination and play and like it has like real actual value that it doesn't mm-hmm. feel preachy and and always feels fun um it first appeared uh in in sort of pop culture awareness the babies in a dream sequence that miss piggy has in uh the muppets take manhattan that's absolutely fucking adorable and apparently was very difficult to puppeteer because their little arms were so short <laughs> but mm-hmm. i thought that was cute um but it had been developed for a while in the muppet um art department just as sort of like an idea that they were having when they were putting together books and various merch and stuff and jim henson was like that's adorable frank oz was like i don't love it but i understand why you think we should do it um the show won scads of awards daytime emmys the humanities <laughs> prize um we get the the like kidification of existing ip because of this this is how we get tiny tunes um because muppet babies mm-hmm. is huge they had albums mm-hmm. comics merch tours pretty sure that as a young child i saw muppet babies on ice at the uh mm-hmm. at the um <laughs> oh my god what's Krauss it called? Heinz? no not across Heinz. what's the the war memorial in syracuse oh. um and there's a reboot in 2018 that is extremely charming and mm-hmm. very and it kind of continues that legacy of being just like a fun show for kids that actually like has a lot going on with it um i i think that's all i'm gonna say for now i have some other fun little facts that we might need to pull out later but let's see that's muppet babies it's absolutely fantastic it's just kind of you know you can look at it and see the sort of craven like let's make them kids people are they're so cute everyone will want a little one but it it actually takes that and makes an unbelievably fun show like the when Mm -hmm. he opens the closet and sees like the star destroyer inside i remember that like (laughs) yes like just so fun yeah yeah I mean, I don't think we can knock the idea that, like, the oh, let's make it commercial. Like, that was the point. That was of the, the point. 80s. It yes. was about yes. art. It was about how can we mine this IP for as mm-hmm. much money as we can. So, honestly, I give them to that. But here's where I'm sitting. I just lost He Man, and I'm on the verge <laughs> of losing the Transformers. And like. <laughs> Those are to me my two tent poles of 80s cartoons. They are inextricably linked to this genre in a way I don't feel that Muppet, Muppet Babies are. Now, uh, again, I'm going to talk about the gender situation here. Like Transformers was was a boy show, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, were there girls that watched Transformers? Possibly. I'd love to hear about your life now. But like, <laughs> it was, I think, almost overwhelmingly for boys right Mm -hmm. and it's kind of hard to get around that whereas muppet babies i think really is for everybody that's another one Mm -hmm. where kind of like smurfs like it didn't matter you could Mm -hmm. enjoy it 
while not every episode of Transformers was great, the character design and the concept mm-hmm. behind the show was brilliant. Robots that turned into other things. Mm-hmm. I discovered Transformers because my parents got me Soundwave for my fifth birthday, thinking it was an actual tape recorder, and they were furious <laughs> when, this, <laughs> when they realized it was just an action figure. And I'm just like, oh no, this is amazing. Um, but then I saw the cartoon, and there's this rich collection of characters and a compelling story arc. And then the end made a movie came along and Mm -hmm. blew it up again and blew my mind and then the series evolved into a whole new aesthetic and a whole new cast of characters and then it ended because 80s kids don't talk about beast wars we don't know her (laughs) because beast wars is dumb but 80s transformers was the shit it was the shit and it like has an arc there are characters Mm -hmm. that actually like grow and change and die and then come back is insane but it's fine um (laughs) to me I, like Optimus Prime is American as fuck. A red, white, and blue tractor trailer in the 80s. Perfection. <laughs> Bumblebee is a precocious and relatable sidekick. Starscream is one of TV's all-time great messy bitches, which is yeah. amazing <laughs> considering he is a robot that turns into a plane. <laughs> and Megatron is a gun. I ask you what greater enemy is in their America in the 80s or today. Mm. So with that being said, I put it to a vote. Uh, Derek, where are you? I think it's fascinating that you're still trying to litigate and and have hashtag justice for Optimus Prime after yes. the best pop culture car episode. <laughs> yes. He let that drag on for way too long. Um, everyone will back me up, including Bob, who is listening. Um, still not over you're it. Not, you're still not over it. And guess what? You're still not winning it. It goes to Muppet Babies. Oh. <laughs> Brendan, you're my only hope. I'm going to say I will, I, I will go. I am closer. I am more torn on this than I was on the prior one because I, I love Transformers. I watched it every day after school. This was a cartoon that was still appointment TV for me. The return of Optimus Prime blew my yes. fucking mind when that came around, all that kind of stuff. Yes. So, like, no, it, it it absolutely is fantastic. And it is maybe my favorite toy line of the 80s because those toys were the coolest just yep. by far. I'm basically torn between Transformers is my nostalgia pick. Muppet Babies is the better show. Like, I just mm. – there's no competition like rewatching that there's a reason it still indoors and the 2018 reboot is great while i will say pretty much everything post 1980s transformers at least my hot take is garbage maybe the bumblebee yeah. movie was being the only exception um but and it is like because yeah muppet babies is an inherently it is the quality version of every crass kids cartoon ever. Yes. It, it's they made the smart, slightly more sensitive, more interesting choice at every turn. And it's genuinely funny and makes kids want to go out and be imaginative and do things and be empathetic. And so it's just hard to vote against my babies for the sense of like <laughs> this is genuine quality versus a really fun thing I did love as a kid. And and I will say, unlike Masters of the Universe, I can go back and rewatch the Transformers movie any day and have a blast. So, like, yes. I get it. <sighs> I'm trying to weigh this through. Let me look at the brackets for a second of what goes next. What, what's I will that? also, I will tell you this, if it makes you feel any better, Brendan, it mm-hmm. kind of doesn't matter. Because, okay. again, if we're split, Muppet Babies is a two seed. Transformers is unbelievably to me unbelievably to me a three seed and then here it is since it's go- since Muppet Babies the genuinely better show we'll move forward regardless Eric I will throw my lot in with you for Transformers <laughs> I I appreciate that yeah. this pyrrhic victory, right? Um, but it doesn't matter. Muppet Babies is continuing, and that is the end of round two. We're going to take a quick break and swim in our money vault. We will be right back after yeah. these messages. Well, hello there. Are you enjoying this episode of The Great Pop Culture Debate? Of course you are. But did you know that there's an entire other half of this episode you didn't listen to? Quel dommage. Our Patreon supporters get exclusive access to all the part ones and warm-ups. Literally, it's like a whole bonus episode. And I'm going to level with you folks. Some of them are funnier than what you hear on the main feed. So if you've ever thought about supporting us on Patreon but decided against it, don't be entitled to that wrong opinion. Head to patreon.com backslash greatpopculture culture debate and subscribe for just five dollars today your support means that we can continue to produce this fabulous show and you get all kinds of great perks treat yourself become a patron of the great pop culture debate today
And we're back for round three of our best 80s cartoon debate. Before we get into the Elite Eight, I want you to know how to follow our panelists on social media because knowing is half the battle. Brendan. Yes. Uh, I, you can follow me over on Twitter with at B underscore Hey, H-A-Y, and also on TikTok at B uh, underscore Hey 42. Um, yeah, that's my socials. And you have some exciting I've, projects coming up? That's what I was going to say. I forgot if I would roll into that or not. Uh, but yes, uh, sometime in 2023, the animated, the kids animated series that I hope is debated by a panelist of four lovely people in, uh, you know, 30 to 40 years. Uh, Gremlin Secrets of the Mogwai will premiere sometime this year on, let's say, HBO Max. And um, yeah, if you want all the fun and uh, future trauma from the Gremlins movies in cartoon form, we are at uh, 1920s set in Shanghai. Mr. Wing from the original movie as a child, first meeting Gizmo, tons of Amblin-esque fun. Uh, also, well, one I other absolutely... thing, just a quick... I'm oh, sorry, you go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, one other thing to plug, not for myself, but for panelist Jennifer Chen, you can pre-order her book, Artifacts of an X, right now on your favorite bookseller of choice. It comes out in November. Please do that. And I was going to say that uh, we absolutely are here for the trauma uh, of the and the yeah. amblin of it all. So thank you very much. Derek, where can people follow you? And do you have any exciting projects that people should know about? Oh, I wish I had exciting projects. No, I do not. But um, you can follow me on Mastodon, which is currently the only social I'm uh, using uh, publicly, uh, at DRKMKT. Great. And how about you, Kate? Any uh, projects you'd like to talk about? And how about your socials? Uh, no projects right now. We're in uh, the sort of we're pupating. We're in that mode right now, <laughs> which actually is one of my favorite modes to be in creatively. Uh, and I'm on Instagram if you want to see pictures of my cats at Gomez Rack. Fabulous. And you can find me at Eric Resniak on Twitter and Instagram. But really, just message the at Great Pop Culture Debate account on Insta or at GPCD on Mastodon. That's the best way to get in touch with us. We're trying to move off of the Bird app eventually. With that being said, let's move on to round three before Nanny starts the beatings again. You remember what happened to Skeeter? <laughs> so. <laughs> Oh my god, that was so dark. I said, well, I took I was in a very dark place when I wrote this script. <laughs> All right, first up, I believe the panel is unanimous again, advancing DuckTales over Adventures of the Gummy Bears. Let's just do a quick ch- uh, Brendan. Yes. Yep, DuckTales. Derek. Yes. Kate. Do do do. Did that, did, that, did that track? Okay, good. It, it, it totally worked, and that's proof that we just say yes to quack. So, yes. yes. <laughs> Most of the panel is feeling blue as Smurfs are currently in the lead to advance to the final four, but Brendan wants to take a shredder to their chances by pushing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles instead. Brendan, call down the turtle power and give me the hand and the foot. I will explain why I'm doing shrooms with the Smurfs. Go ahead, Brendan. Sure thing. Uh, I am shocked. This is, might be my version of your he man and transformers uh losses Mm -hmm. um yeah turtles are the turtles to me here's the the greatest test of the timelessness of the turn teenage ninja turtles you could replace myers briggs as a personality test by just asking people which turtle they are (laughs) (laughs) these are this is basically the character archetypes that were perfected across 80s cartoons that have frankly kind of carried on in all cartoons ever since it's just kind of like oh yeah, these are the characters we need so that people, kids can actually remember and identify with one of these four. Um, on top of that, it's everything I, that was said earlier. Derek said wonderfully earlier. It's like you are never going to get a more 80s concept than, okay, so uh, they're going to be weird creatures that came out of the sewers in a crime-ridden city, but they love pizza. They're super cool. They skateboard. They eat pizza. Uh, they fight. What do kids like? These ninjas. They like ninjas. They fight ninjas. And uh, there's, a, there's a brain. There's a brain with robot body. He tells the bad guys what to do. Uh, I mean, it's just it's so 80s every choice they made. Also, it's I feel like um, – so the Turtles, all great characters in themselves, Splinter, April. But then you also even have – like it's one of the deepest benches, I feel like, of 80s cartoons. April had an entire work life with like mm-hmm. great coworkers, shitty coworkers, stuff like that. The deep roster of bad guys beyond Shredder and Krang, uh, some of the best henchmen with Rocksteady and Bebop. Like it was just – it was so much fun. Every episode felt like, what the fuck are they going to give me in the best possible way? Because you didn't know. Uh, and then going from there, the toys, the comics, the cartoon, I mean, the, the video games, everything else. Smurfs, 
I guess it is for me. Smurfs was for everybody and is 80s as all. Like, I'm, I can't, I'm not going to say it's not, but Smurfs doesn't inspire nostalgia or like wanting to ever revisit. Like, it's, it's captures 80s just in the sense of like, yes, yeah, Smurfs was everywhere in the 80s. Like, Turtles, to me, it's, to, I mean, also just to, my final head to head was, is Turtles and Gem. And to me, there is no more 80s things than those two. Because I can't see them being in created at another time. It's an interesting argument, and like I, I agree with everything you just said. I guess for me, uh, the, the the critical point here is, as Derek pointed out earlier, the Smurfs literally began in 1981, and they ran on original episodes all the way through 89. They were def they were like the animated backbone of that decade, unlike anything else. And to me, the Turtles are in that weird. There's like a three year period between 88 and 91 that are almost their sure. own decade. Like uh, Paula Abdul yeah. will always feel like a '90s artist to me. Yes. In fact, Paula Abdul no, is an all, '80s all her artist. Her in '89. Yep. yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's like its own weird time zone, almost that I can't mm -hmm. like pop culturally. That that doesn't make any sense, but it, that's how I feel. And I almost feel like the Turtles are more '90s properties. Again, understanding that. they started in the eight, late '80s, but th that's my defining thing because everything you said is true. The other thing I will say, though, about the Smurfs, you were saying how the TMNT can be a Myers-Briggs test, but, like, the Smurfs themselves are super memorable and easy for kids to understand instantly and gave us kind of character types and tropes that, again, were used everywhere. You see them in the Snorks. Mm -hmm. You see them in Fraggle Rock. You see, Like, they were... I think that was a formula that was also kind of copied and pasted throughout the 80s. That's but like, what, That's what the Care Bears are, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Papa Smurf is giving us daddy realness. Hefty Smurf is giving us rough trade. Brainy Smurf is helping to define the popular mega nerd trope of the 80s. Vanity Smurf is showing all little gay boys to, that they had a future. And then Smurfette is doing what needed to be done as the sole woman in a town of bare-chested men, life icon. So that's where I'm coming down here. Kate, where are you? You know, I... I I was swayable here because I do think that in terms of like entertaining want to watch like universe the 80s could have only birthed like the turtles right like but I do also I agree with you Eric in my brain they are 90s like they just are like right on that edge decade and I think in terms of like how 80s is it the smurfs is just so 80s like that is i mean disney wasn't what disney is now right like this it was smurfs mm -hmm. right it was that kind of and also just like smurf as like an all purpose like mm -hmm. swear adjective verb <laughs> like any part of speech <laughs> you want it to be yeah. like it's just yeah i think i <clears throat> i have to stick with the smurfs derek i give it to the turtles here because I think at the time in the 80s when it came around, it had a much broader appeal than the Smurfs did. Mm -hmm. Like you had, you know, kids who were maybe born in late 70s or early 80s who were almost aging out of some of these shows, but the the, the Ninja Turtles were there for them. Yep. And even, you know, some of the younger kids, like my sister's five years younger than me, she enjoyed the Turtles too, because it was like something that I was watching and... You know what I mean? Like it was, it, it just had a, a much broader appeal. I will also say this, were it not for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Karate Kid, there would have been a lot of empty dojos in the 80s. And 90s. So, um, I, I give it to the turtles here. So that gives us a tie. Smurfs, I believe is the lower seed. I believe I don't, turtles I don't hate it. is a, I don't, I don't hate the turtles going on. Turtles is a one seed. Am I wrong? Uh, turtles is a two. Excuse me, Smurfs is a two seed, and Turtles is a one seed. Cowabunga. So that means the Cowabunga, Cowabunga dude, <laughs> the Turtles will advance next in a battle that devastates the little gay boy of my youth, but delights my housewife loving messy ass of today. It's a throwdown between the queens of '80s cartoons, Shira, Princess of Power, and Gem and the Holograms. Derek, <laughs> hold aloft your mystical sword and explain why Shira should prevail in this catfight. Brendan, hit a power chord and go straight for the chorus to keep this gem sing along going. I'm gonna start with Derek. So. 
some will say that She-Ra was just He-Man for girls, and to them I say, you are fucking wrong. She <laughs> might have been born out of a... I'm seriously. She might have been born out of a marketing need to create a female analog to, um, to He-Man, but to 80s kids, she became much more than that through the show and all its associated merch. She showed us that representation of powerful female characters is every bit as important as their male counterparts and... The show stands in sharp contrast to the more stereotypical girly offerings like My Little Pony and Strawberry Shortcake and all of that. So Princess of Power, which debuted in 1985, follows the adventures of Princess Adora, Prince Adam's twin sister, who, with the help of her magical sword of protection, transforms into She-Ra and leads a group of freedom fighters known as the Great Rebellion in their fight to free Etheria from the tyrannical rule of Hordak and evil uh, and the evil Horde. There's something very, like, Star Wars-y about this. Sure. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll, we'll go on. Like many animated shows of the 80s, um, She-Ra Princess of Power ran only for two seasons, but it left a huge impression in the minds and hearts of 80s kids, so much so that the property has seen new life in a reboot on Netflix and word on the street is that it may get a live action version coming from DreamWorks. So mm. the lesson to learn here is when millennials are in the driver's seat of pop culture content creation, we will always find a way to bring back our beloved childhood memories to life. Yeah. And not only that, but also make them super queer. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. the Netflix mm -hmm. reboot of She-Ra is crazy LGBT mm -hmm. positive. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I'm not going to give it away, but the, I, they ended it. I was like, it's... wow, they're going there. Yep. I was like, yeah. Uh, Brendan, talk to us about Gem. Uh, yeah. First note, I every, agree with everything Derek said. I think actually this is one of the harder battles in this entire thing because She-Ra is fantastic. Um, but yeah. Going back to my rubric of gem to me is beyond eighties. It is taking it's like just to almost like the word soup of all the like buzzwords of the eighties and putting it into a compelling soap opera. Which also, by the way, TV soap opera is an incredibly eighties thing. But it's like, all right, Jerrica Benton, who then plays a magical synthesizer to to be able to use holograms at her will to, as a superpower to become the biggest <laughs> pop star in the world to then Give it in to her me. Spare time still try to help runaway kids which if you grew up in the 80s was what you were constantly terrified of every show <laughs> every commercial during your cartoons told you the covenant house was gonna have to save your ass because you were gonna get lost somewhere so or locked in a refrigerator <laughs> exactly <laughs> So here is the perfect superhero for that time. Who's also the coolest pop star has the best character design of like anybody, her hair and everybody there. And going back to again, the deep roster it's gem and all of her holograms who is also by the way for eighties, a surprisingly diverse bunch. Yes. Absolutely. Like the holograms are actually really great, diverse characters and they all have a little bit of their own personality. Then you have the misfits who are so much fun. Their songs are better and they are. <laughs> they're fantastic. Uh, and then you also still have sleazy. Uh, what's his name? Eric. Um, oh my God. I'm trying to remember not calling out to you. Uh, Eric Raymond. Nope. But I'm also sleazy. That's fine. There you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Eric Raymond is great. Like, basically, how do you introduce James Spader to 80s children? Like, here we go. <laughs> um, it just was so much fun. And rewatching it, it is still a show that I feel like it, it's, you can rewatch it now, at least as a kid of the 80s, and have so much fun rewatching it. Like, it's good enough on every level. The character outfits are great. Like, again, the fashion sense is fantastic. The music is so much fun. The voice acting. The fact they had an episode that guest starred their knockoff versions of Bruce Springsteen, Stevie Wonder, and Cyndi Lauper. <laughs> it's, yeah, it was just so much fun and so peak 80s. Like, it was just all, yeah, again, it was how do we bring everything in adult culture minus the cocaine down to children? Was it minus the cocaine? I'm honestly not sure. Mm. Yeah, That's fair, fair, mm. fair, fair. Mm. Uh, excellent arguments. Terrific job, gentlemen. Kate, where are you? So here is where I say something that may shock you. <gasps> I have never in my life seen a single episode of Gem and the Holograms. <gasps> Pause. Gem. Just recording. I, 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 truly I, as outrageous. A, it is truly yes. outrageous. <laughs> I, as a young person, I was very sensitive to things that I felt were marketed to girls. Because I was like, fuck you. You don't know a goddamn thing How about me. Dare. How yeah. very you dare you. And just move away. Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it starts with Barbie. And I was like, I don't, this is, I'm supposed to like this. Sorry. I didn't, 
I mean, I, no, no shade to anyone who loves Barbie of any gender at all. But like, I just like, I just resented. I hated being told what to like or what to do, you know. And so I think like I was like, mm. like, which makes me sad because it sounds fucking amazing, and I probably would have loved it. Um, but that did not happen with Shira. I watched Shira. I had the Shira toys. Shira was incredible. I loved it. Um, and I think it is. It's one of those sort of like 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 muppet babies you know kind of like they were it's you could see the idea as being kind of crass like oh it's like you know this established idea let's make them kids it's really cute but actually is subversively like a really quality show i think the same thing kind of happened with she they're like oh make human but a girl and it is just like in every way mm -hmm. infinitely better of a show than he-man oh, yeah. um mm -hmm. yeah and I'm looking here, actually, on uh, the initial group of characters and premise were created by uncredited writers Larry Dottillo. Tilio, I don't mm -hmm. know who that is, but J. Michael Straczynski, who is also, he's like a like a yep. screenwriter. Yep. Um, and did uh, yep. Real Ghostbusters. And did Real Ghostbusters, yeah. So, like, there's real, like, thought and character building and world building behind this. Um, and I just, oh, I forget her friend was, the, like, the little, um, the the peacock lady. She was so mm -hmm. pretty. I had her. Oh, Pika Blue <laughs> Pika was Blue. the peacock lady. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Glimmer was yeah. her like second in command yep yeah so i don't i mean I don't, don't forget don't forget madam raz don't forget madam raz in there. <laughs> i i don't or, know why like this one just sort of like made it under my right my extremely like you know like cut just cutting off my nose despite my face filter of like it's for it's for girls i'm not gonna like it like that yeah anyway she wrote, I will throw out one way. more thing for Jem, by the way. Just a mm -hmm. uh, rare female showrunner in kids animation in the 1980s. That's uh, incredible. Created and run by Christy yeah, Marks. Um, Derek and Kate are on Team Shira. Brendan is on Team Jem. And I am casting my vote. This is where I'm going to repay Brendan's kindness from the last round and switch my vote from Shira to Jem. I was swayed mm. for a couple of different reasons. Just as we said in the Patreon episode, that there was nothing on TV like Voltron at the time. There was nothing on TV like Jem at the time. Literally nothing. It was basically Dynasty, but for kids as a cartoon, that is amazing. There was diversity in the cast in a time where that was not at all expected, not just in the leads, but in the random supporting characters. It was incredible ambitious weaving in original music tracks and creating music videos like what other cartoon was doing anything like that at the time or even now i also want to point out the gem is quintessentially 80s let's talk about those music videos yeah. what could be more 80s mm -hmm. than music videos what could be more 80s than holograms <laughs> and or synthesizers what could be more 80s <laughs> than sleazy record producers and punk girls dragging a bland goody two-shoes protagonist gem could not exist <laughs> in any other decade and in fact has not because the live action film adaptation in the 2010s mm -hmm. was a notable flop whereas Shira has transcended that decade and has been adapted very successfully arguably even improved by the 2010s reboot so for me that's a strike against she-ra my final argument here if you're gonna knock out he-man in round two i don't understand how we have she-ra in the final four yes she-ra was she's better she's better she is better yeah, yeah, she is. hands she down is. she's a better show and the misfits are even better that's right that's right they even say it they say it in their song Our they're very songs clear are about better. this fact very clear but you don't get Shira without He-Man, period. It is a derivative of something this panel has already found lacking in importance or resonance. So period. I, period. <laughs> period. So I question that logic here. But that being said, Derek, are you sticking with Shira? You know, Eric, I'm going to remind you, you said that when He-Man comes up on another episode and just, you know, talk about how, you know, it's, it's, it's all just, it's all inferior to Jem. And I don't even know why we're talking about He-Man or she so. um, No, I will. I, 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 clearly Jem is going to advance here because I think it's a higher seat. No. It's no. not? It's not. she is the higher seat. Ooh. So we are okay, tied. I need, okay. So I need so to, th yeah, then I need to think about this. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Kate, what should I do? Well, I'm going to stick with Shira because I've never seen an episode of Gem. So. Oh, you know what? We're going to pause <laughs> oh, the recording. We'll give another few yeah. days. <laughs> yes. Go watch some Gem. And you'll love it. And then it'll all be fine. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So 
Okay, so the two of you aren't changing your vote, and Kate's not changing her vote. Um, I I am going to go with Jem here. Are I support you? That. Yeah. Are you? You're changing I think, it. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's the right thing to do. I think that you know, you and Brendan made all the good arguments. Um, I I still will say that Shira has a very um soft spot mm-hmm. in my heart. Uh, but there is an upcoming um, argument that we're about to do that has an even softer spot. <laughs> so it's just really squishy in my heart. So um, we'll get to that in a second. And I want you to support me fully on that. Um, I will also just point out that uh, anything I just said against He-Man, I res- reserve the right to completely <laughs> <laughs> deny in any future episodes. You cannot, I'm a hologram. You can't see me. I'm not actually here. <laughs> I have Wait, a creation is that, synergy. Is that, mm-hmm. is that how it. holograms work in the show? You can't see them? No. Holograms can do whatever you want. <laughs> That's okay. the magic of holograms okay. in the 80s. In the 80s. Okay. The, the, yeah. synergy. The, the, the computer to make the hologram takes up the size of a small house, yes. and it can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and am I incorrect that it's in a like drive-in movie theaters? Yes, like, it is. Yes, yes, uh, it is. Uh, which is amazing. So that is yeah. actually I did not expect that to work. Let me be very candid, folks. I fully expected Jem to go out here and Shira to advance to the final four, but I'm kind of amazed at what happened. Kate, are you okay with this? Oh, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. I mean, it's like on a technicality that I knocked Jem out, and it's truly outrageous of me. <laughs> it is truly outrageous. I do. See, I, you're I, already a fan. I can sense this. Thank you. Yeah. Coming. Um, I also want to point out not only should you go and watch Jem, which you should, but you should also watch Jizz, which is the YouTube spinoff <laughs> that <laughs> someone made. <laughs> it's like an R rated version of Jem. So check that out. It's oh. it's not as good as I want it to be, but it is amazing. That sounds, Did a, you... that sounds a lot worse than R rated. I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying, Kate? Did you actually see the gem movie? Like, how bad is it? I, it's I, pretty bad. I didn't see it. Did you see it, Brendan? Yeah, it, it's it's bad. It, it's also not gem. It's one of those. It's gem in name only. Um, yeah, it's more of a like scrappy, scrappy band trying to find the secret of a dead parent movie that happens mm. to touch on. There's a little bit of holograms. There's <laughs> there's. No misfits. There's not really the dual identity. It, it's yeah. Again, very gem and name only. The best moment is it does have a credits stinger with Kesha as uh, Pizzazz from Pizzazz. the Misfits. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's great casting. Honestly, exactly. I can't knock that at all. No, that is true. And we we stand key dollar sign ha. Although I think she re- retired the dollar sign <laughs> in this economy, she can't afford yeah. it anymore. She's just Kesha now. All right, so we will move Jem into the final four. Finally, in round three, I believe that the unexpected juggernaut that is Muppet Babies has a unanimous victory (laughs) over... Unexpected? Unexpected? What is your narrative? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Just let it have its victory here, and we'll move on. Right. A unanimous victory over Garfield and Friends. But am I, uh, Brendan, are you with Muppet Babies here? I am with Muppet Babies. I love Garfield, but uh, Muppet Babies is superior, I think. And clearly, I have a Muppet Babies voting block in Derek and Kate over here. <laughs> the, the Skeeter and Scooter of the great pop culture debate. <laughs> Literally, my nickname as a child, but it was Scooter. So <laughs> That actually means you make it to adulthood. So that's that's good. right. Skeeter, True. That's, yeah, exactly. that's a lot dodgier. Yeah, exactly. So we will be advancing Muppet Babies. And with that, we have our final four. We're going to take a quick break to enjoy a pizza party with Master Splinter. And we will be right back after these messages. And we are back with the final four of our best 80s cartoon debate. Our final four is DuckTales versus Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Gem and the Holograms versus Muppet Babies. I always like to take a step back here and say, is this the final four I would have predicted? And let me say vociferously, no. Um, <laughs> but uh, for our panel, were th- is this what you guys thought was going to come out? Brendan? This is actually three of the four that I had going here. So, yeah, I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, Derek? I don't know that it would have been my final four, but I think it might be the correct final four. Okay. Kate, is it the final four you would have guessed? Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly what my final four was, and I think it's kind of 
reasonable in what I would have guessed. Um, but I would just like to say these sound on both sides of the bracket like killer crossover episodes. <laughs> yes, I agree. I would like to see that. We have two um, anthropomorphic animals uh, doing mm-hmm. crazy adventures, and we have um, child puppets and uh, holographic Dogs and bears and frogs yeah. and bears and chickens and things. Oh yes. And holographic and pop stars. You know what? They're both singing groups. They mm-hmm. are. That's fair. Th- th- these are. Uh, why did we not have a crossover four? But no, I'm not mad about this final four. Let me be very clear about that. Um, I. Uh, but it's it's not what I was expecting. So we're getting into the matchups. First off, it's Ducktales, which we have yet to even discuss, mm. versus Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm gonna just go around the horn. We're gonna start with Brendan. Brendan, where are you on this one? Uh, tough call, but Ninja Turtles. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go to Derek. Wow. Um, no, it is definitely DuckTales for me. Okay, Kate? Absolutely DuckTales. <sighs> um, <laughs> so this one is, uh, first of all, DuckTales is the ultimate number one seed. Is is TMNT a one seed or a two seed? Anybody got eyes on that? It's a one seed. So back. these are two one, one seeds. Yeah. So yeah, it's a one seed. I just checked. DuckTales is the higher one, though. It is the ultimate number one for the entire mm-hmm. bracket. Mm-hmm. Um, I think these were both fairly late in the 80s. I believe that DuckTales arrived first. I'm going to say DuckTales was maybe like 86, 87, and TMNT was like the year after. That sounds um, I had, right. Yeah, if I had to mm-hmm. guess. Yeah. But that being said... Uh, TMNT, I think, had the wider cultural impact where, like, the toys and the video games, although DuckTales had a killer NES game. Um, One of the best. Yeah, it was – It would, but TMNT was its own little cottage industry, whereas DuckTales, it did – yes, Gummy <clears throat> Bears came first, but it did revolutionize Disney's animated cartoon kind of uh, – house right like without mm-hmm. ducktales i don't think you get the rest of the stuff yeah. um and it has been successfully rebooted the tmnt like i swear to god every time a reboot ends another one is starting um these are very evenly matched i think but if we're talking about which ep- which is better as a cartoon i think if i had to choose one to watch i'm gonna watch turtles i'm just putting myself as like eric from 1988 um so does that mean it us evenly split right now two for turtles two for ducktales i believe so and i did just check they both started in 87 damn mm. okay mm-hmm. so, so who would win, win in a fight a turtle or a duck uh, mm-hmm. well <laughs> scrooge mcduck Actually, would, would buy would buy his own hired goons you were gonna say some brendan yeah i was gonna say i mean gizmo duck versus the turtles pretty good matchup mm-hmm. i could see that mm-hmm. going pretty well because otherwise it'd be like splinter and scrooge off to the side yes that's yes true. yes they would have proxies yeah. and of course scrooge mm-hmm. would have his child <laughs> army uh the, yeah. the triplets and <laughs> um yeah i love that for them um we are evenly matched right now uh does unless does someone want to make an argument for why ducktail should advance here over tmnt here's so i'll actually just make the argument for tmnt ducktales is spectacular it actually is one of the best of the disney afternoon block which was spectacular around and on a purely animation and design level i gotta give it to ducktales because it's gorgeous to look at Mm -hmm. i will say however it is adapting really amazing comics from decades earlier yep the roots of ducktales are actually in the serials of the 30s and 40s yep Great point. So duck t- so it's not inherently 80s, which I'm just going to go back to. I mean, and this is also, to be fair, my final two are Turtles and Gem, just to mm-hmm. give it where I'm headed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which to okay. me it are concepts that could have only – are so purely 80s in their creation. It's a great mm-hmm. argument. Does well, someone want to tell you, Brendan, you're headed for heartache. Uh-oh. I know. I get it. <laughs> I get it. I mean, I – what is more 80s than taking pulp material from the 30s and 40s and spinning it into a slick, beautifully produced, incredibly high production values genre television franchise – Indiana Jones. Yes. Right? Like it is yeah, it is it fair. is it is the amblification of yeah. the old uh Donald Duck Scrooge McDuck, 
you know, um, I'm going to, I'm going to die on the DuckTales Hill. I loved it <laughs> as a child. Like it just was so fun and smart, looked incredible. I do remember once I'm going to tell like a thing that I would tell my therapist on this. Like my dad <laughs> caught me watching one time and he made fun of it. So then I had to secretly watch it at my friend's houses. Aww, <laughs> so I've dealt with my trauma. It's, a- it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. But like then Aww. DuckTales was DuckTales was like cocaine. I would like go to people's houses and be like, I need the DuckTales. <laughs> I must know the tales of the duck. Well, and, um, here, and here's the thing. What? I also place it through a rubric of like what theme song sticks in my head more. I couldn't mm. even tell you how the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles theme song goes. Oh. But ooh. So you'd like me to sing it to you. I'm just saying, like the DuckTales theme song just <laughs> It's there. It's in my brain, rent free. Listeners, I wish you could have seen Derek's face. He gave a full like. He re- <laughs> and Brendan is also giving. But face. I'm just trying. I'm not giving up. <laughs> you know that's an interesting I point. Even Turtle Power, it, right? Like I can tell you the chorus of the Ninja Turtle song, but I don't know how it begins. Whereas Ducktales, I know how it begins. That's weird. Dun, 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 that's fair. In the turtles, Duck-Turk, yeah. <laughs> in keeping with the '80s of it, oh, I mean, no Ducktales synthesizer driven i can't really knock it for not mm-hmm. being 80 but the ninja turtles has like the whole guitar shred open into mm-hmm. the teenage mutant ninja turtles teenage mutant ninja turtles i'm committed teenage yeah. mutant ninja turtles here's, here's on the hatch shell. Shell. Turtle, turtle power, power. yeah like that, oh, that so i totally catchy. get that so melodic it is catchy you. How dare you. <laughs> it is catchy here's i will say this though brendan like even the way we you just described it feels more 90s to me than 80s and this is my thing with turtles no that's fair that's fair is right. to me even though it started in 87 and was very popular at the end of the 80s it does feel more 90s than 80s in certain ways and ducktales does not ducktales feels 80s mm-hmm. so well, that being and, said kate just, and De- well, go ahead derek oh. not just that i also think that if you don't have the successes of Disney animation television in the 80s, you do not get cinematic, you know, Renaissance Disney film in the 90s. I just, I don't think oh, it just happens. So, yeah, I agree with that. Kate, you were going to say what something is else? more, what is more 80s than a capitalist duck? <laughs> it's, that's true. Well, that's yeah. Swimming through money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. swimming through money. That's, yeah. And- who, who wants to eat the rich? I do. <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> Um, Gordon Gecko. Jones and Gordon Gecko became one character. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly right. Love that. Yeah. And again, and, but a but a, with a duck. That's yeah. fair. <laughs> okay, I won't be mad. I do. Ducktales is great. I will not be mad at this. I, I think we have to acknowledge that Ducktales is going to advance here. Uh, it is the ultimate number one seed. So let's go to this final matchup. It's Gem versus Muppet Babies. Let's go reverse order. Kate. <laughs> oh, Muppet Babies. Obviously. I know. <laughs> Derek. <laughs> Yeah, when the room looks kind of weird and you wish that you weren't there, just close your eyes and make believe and you can be anywhere. (laughs) And uh, Brendan? Uh, I'm going to stick with my ultimate number one gem, although I uh, love love Muppet Babies. I do agree on its greatness, but again, gem. Really outrageous. (laughs) Yeah, so I think we have to discuss this. There is a weird... (laughs) generational shift i think within our panelists and i know that sounds crazy uh, by like a year of, yes. but that's an important <laughs> year because yeah. like brendan and i both are just like yeah we we knew of muppet babies like i had i think my younger brothers watched it more than i did mm. but you guys were like firmly entrenched in like the muppet baby army you were mm-hmm. in the milieu right the, we were mm-hmm. we were known as I don't know what we were. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No. I don't know. You got nowhere to go there. You can't. Yeah. Well, go and here's that, what yeah. I'm going to say about that. Like we, we talked about it earlier in the episode where Kate mentioned that you have like little cutaways and like other pop culture references that are woven through Muppet babies. And like that made it, um, a little bit more sophisticated of a program and like it, yeah. it gave mm-hmm. you other pop cultural touchstones without you really even realizing it, that, that it was happening. So, I, I think you can't discount that. You know? More sophisticated. I, I agree. And I will say the argument, if I had to make one for Muppet Babies, is actually also that is maybe the most 80s detail of Muppet Babies because none of that would be possible now. On a purely no. the way that corporations and cartoons are yep. made, the way they used film clips, the way they pulled so freely from everything, the way they also, frankly, 
did so many jokes that were going to fly over the heads of kids. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And not in a sense like, oh, we're just trying to throw one in for the adults. But it's like, no, we're just going to put in stuff that, like, is going to – the kids will be curious enough and they'll figure it out themselves. Like, we're actually going to help them kind of just learn a bit, not in the educational sense, but in the cultural sense. Um, Be curious about the world. Exactly. So, no, I mean, that is something that does not exist and is truly of its time. And that's uh, also why, like, you couldn't get old Muppet Babies for yes, forever, right? Because sure. they couldn't get the rights to sure, all the music yeah. and all the clips. And, like, it just, yep. like, they, they produced it purely, like, completely of its time, not even realizing the way that media and the way that we consume media oh, yeah. was going to get so corporate and so huge and controlled. And, and yeah, it was very sophisticated. I feel like it had a very kind of cutesy, like, entry point to it. And I was obviously, like, a huge Muppet kid, so that was my entry. Yeah. But it was much more sophisticated um, mm-hmm. and funny. And, like, I watched it, you know, when did, I forget when we said it came on, like, 85, 86 maybe? or 85 or 86. 86 yeah. yeah. But yeah. I definitely, like... Ooh, it's somewhere around there but i watched it through like second grade like mm-hmm. i that i mean that was the sh- that was my favorite cartoon well down. and you know what i also say too i don't know that we would have the same relationship with like the actual quote-unquote live action muppets that we do as a generation were it not for yes. having muppet babies yeah. as an entry point Oh, so yeah. I will disagree with that one. And Brendan, I'm mm-hmm. curious your opinion on this one yes. because I was like, for me, the original OG Muppet puppet Muppet, like in syndication. Yeah, the show? Well, like I yes. absolutely watched Same. that, like from the age of like two to TV. four. It was agreed. It was like on, like we yeah. watched it as I remember watching it in the living room vividly yeah. to this day. Mm-hmm. And like, so yeah. that was pre Muppet Babies for me. So again, it's that like it's a year, but when you're a kid, mm-hmm. a year makes a huge difference in your references. Yeah. I think yeah. for these shows. Yeah. No, because Muppet Babies to me was almost the end of the franchise. It's like, well, yeah, they did three movies. They had the live <laughs> action series. So, yeah, now there's this other cartoon, like that kind of thing. Yeah. It, even as a kid, if I didn't have those words yet, that's how it felt to me. Like, yeah. my Muppets were, you know, when I saw Muppets Take Manhattan, like as much as humanly possible in a theater when it came out. So, in, in my I did, day, I did do that too. <laughs> Miss, yeah, yeah, yeah. In my day, Miss Piggy was an adult and she worked at a makeup counter with Joan <laughs> Rivers. <laughs> That's my Muppet. Um, uh, no, I just wanted to point out, like, we're saying that it's more sophisticated than Jim. Jim is a show about, like, the inner workings of a record label Which, and holograms. <laughs> like, well, Jim is the entryway to every older culture of the 80s. Like, that was the, we're not even going to really try to kid this down. No. We're giving you full adult protagonists, doing adult jobs, dealing with drug abuse, runaways, every possible thing. <laughs> but, like, in a way that talk about appointment television gem was my show to run home for like and it was the funny thing of i because there's still so much gendering in kids sure. stuff of the 80s yep. sure i was saying it was for transformers which i forget was either right before or right after yeah. in the block i'm like yes but gem was what it was pulling me in i was <laughs> not going to miss an episode of gem i remember staying in a hotel room during a family vacation and like being like no i'll see you all at the pool in a half hour because i am not missing the next installment <laughs> of gem I am so jealous of you because our block was Scooby Doo to He Man to Transformers. I, I we I don't even know if we had Gem on oh. our maybe it was on Saturdays. Was, was Scooby Doo even in this discussion? Sorry, did I miss it? Scooby Doo is a seventies cartoon. It is seventies cartoon. Yeah, and they were yeah. absolutely reruns that were on. And I I yeah, I, rem- yeah. I was a WSTM Scooby Doo Club kid. I had a no! card. Oh. <laughs> and it was Scooby Doo, then He Man, then Transformers, and I don't remember what was after Transformers because I think my father came home from work then and was immediately screaming at us. But why isn't the house cleaned and that whole thing? But um, <laughs> all right, so um, we have. I two- mean, I think we are. Like you said, we're talking about like a micro generation yes. here, right? Like, yep. absolutely. Derek and I are just like a year a year younger, right? Mm-hmm. And like you, you're gravitating to the show that is already presenting slightly older, and we're mm-hmm. gravitating the show that's presenting a little younger but is actually like like i read somewhere once someone was making an argument about the difference between elmo and grover where like el and basically saying like he missed grover because elmo is just like "Ah, Mm -hmm. ah." but grover is a little older and is trying to get kids like curious about the world and comfortable with Mm -hmm. like growing up a little bit um I don't know how I'm just thinking about Muppets. (laughs) I do most of the time. I get that. Yeah, Yeah. I get that. So I believe we are again, evenly split. Gem is definitely not a one seed. I believe gems, gems, and Muppet babies is a one seed. Am I correct? Let's see. 
Uh, Muff Babies is a two seed. Me. Oh my god, they're both two god, seeds. God damn! Wait, 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 wait. I can go to the... Let's find out which one got more votes. This is appointment television, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, forget about Jem. Let's see which got more... Muppet Babies was the sixth highest, and Jem was the seventh highest vote getter. Wow. God damn! So, wow. Muppet Babies comes in Whew. my god i don't know if it's ever been this tight at the top so we have a final two yeah this is a kid's cartoon so i'm gonna I, i'll I, cheerfully withdrawn um no! oh god <laughs> tuck tales versus muppet babies is a final two let's start in the middle with derek where are you going well i will say that i'm kind of really glad that these two are in the final too because i feel like they're very evenly matched as far as like demographic they're appealing to and animation quality and everything else um for me it's still muppet babies i just i, I think it to kate's point it like it it pushes the boundaries a little bit more and and brings kids into other worlds that maybe they're not getting from regular um animated programming so i'm gonna stick with my muppet babies all right, I'm going to go to Brendan. Where are you on this? Um, I, uh, actually, Muppet Babies as well. Um, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, uh, DuckTales is just a case of I actually like the video game more than I ever liked the cartoon. <laughs> I, it's, I respect the cartoon. It is a gorgeous cartoon. And again, the comics is based on are great. Like, no, not a knock on any way. I just never was as into it uh, versus I did thoroughly watch it and love uh, Muppet Babies. Yeah. Fascinating. Kate, I think I know where you're going here. <laughs> Muppet Babies all the way? Mm-hmm. Is that what you thought I was going to say? I, yes. I did think oh. that's what you were going to say. Yeah. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would have voted for DuckTales, I'll be honest. Uh, I, I, f- I think Muppet Babies is, is great. Don't get me wrong. It's lovely. But in no way, shape, or form would I consider it the top cartoon of the 80s. I think it's wild that we ended up here. Um, I but- was astonished at your incredulosity i am i am incredulous it's true but you know what uh that is why we do this and that is why democracy doesn't work ladies and gentlemen Mm -hmm. um no no no. in all seriousness i'm not disrespecting anybody muppet babies is is, is a great show um and i'm not gonna knock it it was clearly resonating with this panel so there you have it folks our pick for the best 1980s cartoon is muppet babies do you agree do you think we totally smurfed this up tell us how you really feel by leaving a comment on this episode at greatpopculturedebate.com or find us on instagram twitter facebook or mastodon while you're there make sure that you subscribe and follow the podcast so you can hear about what new debates are coming soon vote in open polls and even decide which topics we tackle next and if you really enjoyed this episode please take a minute to like and rate the episode or or the podcast itself on Apple, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen on. I want to say thank you to my panel. You are always invited over to play He-Man. And thank you for listening. If you loved what you heard, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where you can get even more exclusive content and get episodes a whole day early. We hope you have a good one. And remember, everyone is entitled to their wrong opinion. Autobots, roll out! You knew I was not going to let Transformers go. (laughs) You knew it. (laughs) 